It's always important to learn from our mistakes, and on this car audio build that I did about 15 years ago, holy cow, I definitely made some. For those of you that might be new, I'm Mark. Welcome to Car Audio Fabrication. Here on this channel, we learn how to master car audio and how to design, build, and install our dream car audio system. The ideology that I like to have is to always be learning from our mistakes and always be advancing our skill set. In today's video, we're going to do a build review on one of my old builds because I want you guys to understand that I didn't just magically start making subwoofer builds like I do today overnight. It takes a ton of practice and making mistakes and there's a lot we can learn Learn from on this past build so let's dive on in and take a look so this is it guys this is the build so like I said this was from about 15 years ago so this was back in that era that the curved and molded fiberglass volcano enclosures were popular and here you can see we've got two 15 inch subwoofers in the trunk of this fusion I believe it was a fusion a Ford fusion you can see you've got a little amplifier rack mounted there this is the build that we're going to be taking a look at and you'll notice the enclosures are ported but like i mentioned this is two 15s ported in the trunk of this vehicle and i don't remember the exact specs that i used at the time but i'll tell you right now they probably weren't quite in large enough enclosures in order to get proper air volume so this is one of the first mistakes that i really want to bring up off the bat because it is so common and i talk about it a ton here on the channel guys when you are planning out your subwoofer builds don't get too excited and just buy the largest subwoofers that you think you can possibly fit Take a little bit of time to measure out the width, the depth, and the height available in a trunk like this, and do the actual math to see how much air volume you're going to have after all of the displacements that come along with a ported box. If what I just said is foreign to you and you don't have a good understanding of how to do those calculations, I do have a related video here on the channel for subwoofer box calculations that you might find helpful. Building a great audio system really starts before you ever end up installing anything. You really need to pick out the right gear. A quick shout out to our sponsor for this video, Crutchfield, because they are an excellent resource for making sure that you're picking out the right gear for your build. On the Crutchfield website, you can enter the year make and model of your vehicle and then you can see exactly which speakers and head units and other car audio equipment will fit for your build. It's very easy to use the website to narrow down between different brands and once you find the speakers that you want to use you can also see the installation gear that you're going to need. Things like speaker adapters, wiring harnesses, and with qualifying purchases Crutchfield also includes their master sheet which is basically instructions for how to remove the different panels to access the radio and speaker in your vehicle. They are definitely a great resource to use. I've used them for many years long before I ever started the channel. So if you guys want to check them out too and take advantage of a special offer for car audio fabrication fans, you can do so at the links down in the video description. Now back into our build here, let's see how I actually built these enclosures. Now first off, I had to build the enclosures separately because there was no way I would be able to get this large of an enclosure into the trunk in one go, so I had to build them in two separate pieces. Knowing what I know today, I try to avoid this as much as possible. I want to use an enclosure size that makes more sense for the vehicle. This vehicle, probably the largest that should have been used is something like 212s. And if I want to get more output, get a better amplifier and more power and subwoofers that could handle more power, I really like to try avoid doing this because it results in an obnoxious seam line that you can see in the middle there. Now there are ways that we could have possibly hidden this seam. I could have added an additional beauty panel in the front of it. This is something that you could do if you did have to build two separate enclosures. Now another thing I noticed right away is the tops of these enclosures were made with separate pieces of wood. I don't know why that was. I don't know if I was just being cheap and I didn't have enough material, so I used two smaller pieces. Who knows? Definitely try to make everything out of one large piece if you can. You'll also notice that I have this curvature on both sides and obviously you want these pieces to be symmetrical and it looks like on the bottom I did a pretty good job of making everything symmetrical but not so much on the top and a way you could do this even though it's pretty clear that I used a jigsaw to make these cuts and not some form of template what you could do even if you used a jigsaw on one side to make this curved piece I could use 
a router with a flush trim bit in order to copy this surface to another piece here. Whenever you have two of something in an install with a line of symmetry down the middle, you definitely want everything to be perfectly matched on each side. And in this case, these were not. Now, another good idea is on these edges here that I'm going along with the cursor right now, I needed to be able to wrap stretch material over to that in order to fiberglass it. And it's usually a good idea to run a rabbiting bit on the router to add a groove to that board. That just gives you a nice way that if you are still doing this kind of old school design style of using the fiberglass, you could have that stretch material come and land inside of that little rabbited groove. And it's going to be flush with the top of the surface once you start building it up and adding resin and body fill and everything else. That way you can sand everything nice and perfectly smooth rather than in my case, I probably am going to have the material just sitting on top here and going to have to somehow body filler it and form it into the top of the enclosure. Here's another angle of the enclosure here and it's always a good idea to use a round over bit on the router to add a round over to all edges of the port. But you can see it looks like I only did this edge, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I should have done all of the edges there. Another thing to kind of pay attention to, you see a lot of drywall screws kind of holding everything together. Today, I like to use brad nails more as it's the actual wood glue that's giving all of the strength to the joint once it's dry between the two different boards. I try not to have the wood screws because if I did want to use a router after everything is assembled here on the outside edge to round everything over, you can't really run a router bit through a screw. It's not a good idea. But brad nails, on the other hand, you can usually keep them far enough out of the way that they're not going to hit the bit. Another angle to look at here, what I will say I did a pretty good job on, is even though this was a really complex shaped enclosure, I did do a pretty good job of keeping everything pretty square it looks like where all the surfaces mate up to each other nicely and I have a nice wood glue seam between each of them keeping them nice and sealed where they should be. It is interesting that with these two different halves set on a flat floor that there is kind of a gap between the two. Uh, it looks like everything was nice and tight down at the bottom. I can't remember when I built this if I sent some screws through the inside of the enclosure to kind of suck the two halves back together. But regardless, if I was forced into doing these two separate halves like this today, I definitely want to make sure, one, I had a plan again for hiding that seam, and two, have a plan for how everything is going to be held nice and completely perfectly flush together while keeping the bottoms of the enclosure at a 90 degree angle to that plane. So moving forward here, I don't have any pictures of just the raw material stretched. I've already stretched the material and I probably had some wooden dowels in place holding these wooden rings to line them up where I needed the subwoofers to be. And I've already removed the support dowels at this point because I've added all the fiberglass resin along with the fiberglass chop mat but here you can see on the top of the enclosure, kind of what I was talking about, this surface is built up higher than the top wooden surface. So I probably had to spend a ton of time sanding and trying to get this level. And it looks like there's even some body filler back here that I had to kind of try to fill that up with to get everything looking nice. I really dislike this style of box now. I hate working with the fiberglass. I feel like it's unpredictable to get a perfect shape, especially when you're trying to mirror and match two sides like this. You really have to make sure that your skeleton is absolutely perfectly matched on each side. And the other problem here, you'll notice that my speaker rings, you know, they're not horrible, but definitely used a jigsaw on this especially for cutting rings, we always want to try to use a woodworking router along with a jig to properly cut those circles. If we do take a close up look at some of the fiberglass areas, you'll see a difference in the coloration. Like this area is very light here, whereas this area is more dark. And that's kind of an indication of not getting enough saturation of either the, the base fabric material or the fiberglass itself. You wanna make sure that you have a nice consistent look everywhere so that you really saturate that resin down into the fiberglass to get perfect strength. These light areas could be an indication of bubbles and after we apply all the body filler and paint this this could be an area that would be more prone to cracking another angle for you here you can really see how i just laid these fiberglass chop map pieces on top of here 
Again, what a pain to have to try to match all that up perfectly when I could have just sunk this edge down in with that rabbiting bit and kept it nice and flush. Here in this picture, it looks like I started laying out my little beauty panel that I was going to have down below between the subwoofers. So that was made with the router. It doesn't look too horrible. What I can tell right away, this is a common mistake when people are new to using a router. You have to make sure that you always have firm pressure pushing down on the workpiece as you're running it through the router table. In this case, you know, this side here would be facing down as I run it through the chamfer bit. And I can tell that I didn't have firm pressure because I can see some chatter marks on the chamfer here. This has a chamfered edge. The inside has a round over the edge, which doesn't look too bad other than this little spot here. But the outside, I definitely didn't have firm pressure going all the way around, especially right here when you don't have that nice perfect pressure or when you don't take the time to go around a couple of times to make sure that you really fully remove all the material that should be removed, you end up with kind of these odd waves in the part. Here in this picture, you can really see what I was talking about. That is completely unacceptable. I would definitely not make that mistake nowadays. Make sure you have that firm pressure while you're routering. Kind of a fun side note here, my really good friend at the time, him and I had this company that we called Infinity Customs, and that's kind of the company name that we built all these enclosures and everything under. So I wanna hear from you guys. What was your first company name if you've ever kind of built enclosures or had a company name that you sold enclosures or whatever car audio gear to other people with? I just want to hear from you. What was the company name? And do you still use that same company name? Let me know. Here's a picture of the subwoofer. I believe this was a, some, a power acoustic subwoofer. And what I do remember is luckily the uh, mounting depth of this 15 inch sub wasn't too large. And luckily the motor structure there wasn't oversized because I did have to carefully tweak these rings and make sure that they weren't lined up in a way that the magnet was going to actually hit the port. I do remember that to this day that it was kind of a, an oversight almost that the port extended this far in. Again, I didn't properly plan things like I should have. I'd already made the cuts for the top and bottom of the enclosure, so I knew that I couldn't have the rings too far out to give the magnet clearance in this area because it would just give it such a weird shape. I remember doing a lot of finessing to really get those rings perfect so that the magnet wasn't going to interfere. So now here we are into the body filler stage and uh, for being sanded, I could tell you this looks pretty darn bad. There are a ton of different pinholes in different spots. Really after your first layer of body filler, and you know sanding it down and shaping it you shouldn't be seeing this kind of thing and i can tell this actually looks fairly smooth like i'd been sanding on it for a while or i had kind of stepped up through different sandpaper grits already and you definitely shouldn't do that when you have all of this misshapen body filler work going on and again look at the insides of these rings just ugh, just not looking good at all definitely a lot here that could be improved. It does look like I tried doing some guide coat sanding, which is basically where you could take some dark black paint and lightly mist it onto the surface. Yeah, I must have, because you can see it right here. And then you start sanding and it gives you an idea where the high and low spots are. You can tell where the low spots are because the paint kind of still stays there, but just wasn't using it at the right point in this process. I really needed to apply you know, a better, almost thicker layer of body filler to start with, and then use proper sanding blocks and everything to really give it that shape. Based on how this looks, I'm guessing I was probably just using my hand with some sandpaper. Here we are into the trunk now, so it looks like the uh, the enclosures, I was probably doing a test fit. Good that they, uh, they still fit. we have got the subwoofer test fit there. Here's another test fit picture here, and you will notice with this trunk, this is much more common nowadays, where you see all of the trunk hinge parts will be up in this area here, so they're not really going to interfere with anything inside the trunk, which is good. If you do have hinges that go down into the trunk, do not make the classic mistake of doing a full car audio build with the trunk open, and then going to close the trunk and realizing it hits the build. Now what's interesting here, and I actually forgot about this, but I mentioned to you guys wanting to try to hide that seam. And now that I'm looking through these pictures, it looks like I did try to in fact hide it. 
So what I did here is I first applied a layer of aluminum foil and it's kind of roughly held in place there. And the idea was this aluminum foil would be a barrier between you know, the enclosure that I have going on and this new piece that I'm working on adding. Aluminum foil works well from, you know, kind of masking off a large area like this, but I will say that it can obviously kind of shift and move. It doesn't have any adhesive on the back side. So if I were to do this today, I would definitely just spend that little bit of extra money to use a roll of good painter's tape to really protect all of this surface to then try to pull a mold off of it. The layup of the fiberglass doesn't look horrible, but what I should have done is I should have taken like a Sharpie or something and drawn out what I wanted the shape of this finished piece to be. That way I could make sure that I, you know, fully extended and got enough layers and thickness all the way out to the outside edges of where I had drawn that perimeter. Because I can tell you right now, this looks nice on the middle. It looks like I have, you know, a good couple of layers built up there. But on the outside edges here, this is definitely looking pretty thin, not to mention, you know, back here, I hope that wasn't part of the piece because over here, it looks like I have good saturation that far back, but over here, not quite so much. So now you can see now after the fact I added that Sharpie in order to sketch it out so that I could properly trim it. But again, it's gonna be really difficult to get a perfectly symmetrical cut from side to side. And you can see that I built up the inside here with some foam. I obviously use that spray type foam that you get at the hardware store. That really isn't the best type of foam to use for fiberglass. You wanna to go to like a marine supplier, like a boat building supplier to get that type of foam. It would be more of a two-part foam where you mix the two chemicals together and it's a lot easier to sand. If you guys have ever tried to sand this foam that you get from the hardware store, it really doesn't sand, it's like too soft to do so. You can see I've got some of my amplifier rack work going on here, so it looks like I made a nice little wooden piece that kind of matches up to the shape of the enclosure, but not perfectly, obviously. So I would have tried to do a better job there, if not just have it extend under the enclosure and be one large sheet. You know, that way you definitely don't see any sort of edge. Here I used body filler around the outside of this insert that the amplifier mounted onto, but I'm not quite sure why I didn't have the body filler go all the way inside here. It looks like it may have even kind of chipped off or something. Man, I'm not sure what that's all about, but that is just not right. You would definitely want all that body filler to really form in there and look perfect. Another picture here. I mean, guys, I just, I look back at this from 15 years ago. And at the time, you know, I was young and trying to learn, you know, darn it, I was doing my best, but that's what it takes sometimes. You have to learn, you have to practice, you have to fail in order to get better. And uh, there was a lot of failing going on here, but nevertheless, let's keep going. So this is after applying some, uh, some high build primer and one of my buddies at the time was kind of getting into the auto body working. Uh, so he actually did all of the primer and paint work on these. And what's interesting is if you look closely at these finished pictures, I think we kind of just decided that uh, that we kind of liked this look, I guess, of the the blue with kind of the black primer showing through. I don't know what we were thinking. Again, we were learning. This ring actually turned out pretty good. And uh, that acrylic on the inside there with a vinyl decal. And I definitely just sanded the backside of that acrylic to give it the frosted look. Interesting. Again, you can see that the transition between this Amprac piece and the subwoofer enclosures itself, there's a huge gap right there. Definitely should have tried to avoid that. And I don't think that we ever ended up even using that piece that I made up here. I don't know if it just ended up being too hard to wrap or what, who knows. Really what it boils down to is there was just a lot of lack of planning here from purchasing subwoofers that were far too large to not really even planning out the electrical. My buddy that owned this vehicle that did the paintwork, I'm pretty sure he did all the electrical stuff, but, but yeah, you can see how it's kind of just a mess over there. And uh, I don't know that that ground wire is properly sized. It should definitely be the same size as this positive wire here. I think it might have been, but it's kind of hard to tell from that picture. Regardless, there's definitely some things that aren't quite right that were going on here. 
15 years ago when we did this build. Yeah, here it is, guys. Look at this. I was right. There's that positive wire and there's that ground wire. Oh, like I said, I didn't do the wiring on this because I, I would have known that. And I'm pretty sure I probably told him that that needed to be fixed. But guys, that's obviously not right. And I guess I should probably clarify, if you don't know why that's not right, in any electrical circuit, all the electrons are going all the way through that circuit. So if we have enough current that is going through our positive lead that we need to have that large positive wire, we should also have the same size large ground wire to allow that same large amount of current. Now eventually my buddy that owned this vehicle did pull his enclosures out of the car so that he could rework the bodywork and respray these. Like I said, he was going to school for that, I believe at the time. So you can see that these did end up looking a lot better ultimately. You can see that's pretty nice blue look there. And he also did finish off the rest of the enclosure with, you know, I don't know if he used just a black primer outside. He did also finish off the rest of the outside of the enclosure here. I don't recall what paint he used, but you know, it definitely looks better than what it did. Definitely a little bit more finished here, but again, you know, there's definitely some gap issues going on. It looks a little bit better, but not much. Also, you might have noticed earlier in the video that there were some large hexagon type screws holding these subs in. Ah, these guys right here. See those? Uh, those didn't look quite right either. I don't know if that was all that we had on hand at the time, but it does look like we made a better decision eventually and went with these smaller, more appropriately sized round head screws. Now I've got some homework for you guys. Next time you finish a car audio build, I want you to take some mental notes of things that maybe went wrong and things that you could improve upon in the future. I find that it really helps cement it in your brain if you take the time to write it down or even type it in your phone and save it in a list that you can review later. One thing's for sure, we definitely don't want to ever make the same mistake twice. Don't forget, next time you are planning out a car audio build, be sure to check out the resources over at our show sponsor, Crutchfield. You guys can learn more about them and take advantage of a special offer for car audio fabrication fans at the link on screen or down in the video description. A big thanks to them, along with Mike, Jerry, Mo, William, and the rest of the Patreon membership team. Big thanks to all those guys for making these videos possible, and thank you for tuning in and watching.